Good evening. My name is Mark Guerin. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and we warmly welcome you to this evening's JFK Junior Forum. Uh, this has been a busy uh, season already in this academic year here at the Forum, with a lot of focus on election 2020, uh, influences of the pandemic, economic realities, racial and social justice issues, um, and an exploration of all these topics with our fellows here for the fall semester. So we hope you've been able to join us and we're delighted to have all of you here this evening. Tonight, we turn to the topic of the rise of hate and extremist ideology in our society. We're just a few days beyond the 19th year observance of the 9-11 that brought so much change to individual lives into so much of our policy making. Since that time, 19 years ago, efforts have been made uh, to make our nation safer uh, through intelligence, through blocking financial assets, through a whole range of policy measures um, aimed at stopping radicalization, aimed at curbing hate uh, and extremist ideology in our nation and beyond. The question that our distinguished panel will explore tonight, are we any safer? Uh, where are we in terms of the rise of hate and um, extremist ideology? And we are fortunate to have um, a, a panel of experts who counsel presidents, who've been engaged in policy making, who are still engaged as thought leaders uh, in and around these topics. We're fortunate that several <laughs> they know the Institute of Politics well, having served in important ways. So we warmly welcome them. Let me introduce them and then I will turn it over to our distinguished moderator uh, for the conversation and to take your questions. First, uh, we're very fortunate to have Anarima Bagara, who joins us here. Uh, she is a graduate of the college, is a friend who has worked very hard for public service issues at the college. But she joins us uh, this evening, especially in her role as vice chair of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, she was also an Institute of Politics fellow. Farah Pandith was the first ever uh, sp US special representative to the Muslim communities in the Obama administration, uh, also an Institute of Politics fellow following her distinguished government service in the Obama administration. And finally, Juan Zarate, uh, a graduate of the college as well, who is a deputy assistant to the president and deputy national security advisor for combating terrorism in the Bush administration. Uh, and he has yet to be an Institute of Politics fellow, I guess. <laughs> but uh, we, we look forward to that at some point, Juan. Uh, and finally, um, returning to Harvard as a graduate in this way to moderate is Garrett Graff, who is a well-known journalist and author uh, who wrote an important book, The Only Plane in the Sky, which was an oral history of 9-11. And he brings his experience uh, from reporting and his, his, his book to this conversation. So we thank each and every one of the panelists and Garrett for your moderation. We hope you will all join us on Thursday uh, for our next forum, which will have our one of our fellows for this fall semester, uh, Chastin Buttigieg, who will be discussing in conversation with uh, finding your voice in public service, uh, an important topic that he has written about in his new book with uh, also a former IOP uh, fellow, Betsy Hodges, the former mayor of Minneapolis. So with my thanks to our panel for this important topic and the exploration of these issues, I'll turn it over to Garrett with my gratitude uh, for, for moderating this evening. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks, Mark, for that, that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here tonight with a great set of panelists. Um, and I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that I'm sorry that none of us are there in Cambridge together. Um, it, it was I, I have incredibly fond memories of my time at the IOP as an undergraduate and uh, as a study group fellow. Uh, and also the place where I met uh, for the first time my classmate and friend uh, Pete Buttigieg, who was uh, involved in the IOP when I was there as well. Um, so this, this is a great topic, um, an important one for this time of year every September as we take stock of the ever marching onward uh, 
history as we watch 9-11 shift from memory into history and take stock of what it means to our country today. So uh, we're gonna spend tonight talking about the legacy of that day, the legacy of the ideologies that caused that day and how uh, extremism in all of its forms has evolved in the nearly two decades since. So we have a great cross section of panelists uh, who have looked at this problem from all different lenses in government, the private sector, and the uh, nonprofit NGO world. So I want to start by asking each of you, uh, and I'll come to you first, Anarima, and then to Farah, and then to Juan to talk a little bit about how you, from your role with your background, have seen hate evolve over the last 20 years. Um, this is an issue that the US government, that governments around the world have invested, uh, arguably at this point, trillions of dollars in combating since 9-11. Um, that uh, it, we have had some notable successes along that time. Al-Qaeda, uh, the group that was responsible for 9-11, did not attack the US homeland again successfully for 18 years, which I think for those of you who served in the Bush administration would have been an unthinkable record during the time that you were involved in the crucible of government after 9-11. And yet, at the same time, in many ways, we see the threat from extremists uh, today actually, in, in some ways, more prevalent and more diverse than it was in 9-11, uh, in and that we, we have seen uh, in recent years the rise of white supremacy and white nationalism. Uh, actually responsible for far more deaths uh, and domestic extremists responsible for far more deaths inside the United States than either uh, Islamic extremists or foreign terrorists. So uh, Anarima, wh why don't you kick us off by talking a little bit about just how you have seen hate evolve uh, over these last nearly 20 years and what perspective you bring to this discussion. Thank you so much, Garrett. And it's such a pleasure to be able to be with you virtually at the place that I got most of my college education at, which was at the Institute of Politics and, and in the forum. Uh, and, and so I think in, in many ways, I want to talk about what's been happening, you know, and what we've been witnessing as, as part of the, the commission. And that's really looking at the ways in which communities around the world have been uh, targeted and and then led to led on the path towards genocide and and so I think a lot about what's happened in places like Burma, uh, with the Rohingya in China with the Uyghurs and in places like Nigeria and India where I think part of the way in which hate has evolved is that it can catch like wildfire uh, within minutes within hours and we see the ramifications of that in terms of violence very quickly and so it, the the. The, the kind of radicalization, polarization process, one that we then have seen over time lead to, to the violence that certainly was around during the time of 9-11 and has been for a long time, is something that we're, we're seeing happen very quickly in places where communities have lived together for a long time in, in, in some relative balance, right? So I think that's, that's where, in many ways, on a global scale, we've seen millions of people entire communities, entire regions of countries displaced, uh, subject to mass killing, to rape, to genocide, uh, in, in something that has started with, uh, with, with messages of hate from a few and has caught, uh, as, and, and has caught up um, in, in, in very fast ways uh, for, for a whole community. And so in Burma, for example, we see the way in which uh, social media uh, Facebook in many ways is, is feels like the internet to people in Burma and Bangladesh. And so Buddhist monks, others uh, in, the, in the Burmese military, those were platforms that really led to uh, very quick violence, not only in, in three years ago where we saw the displacement of, of 740,000 
people uh, externally and then internally 120,000. But also we saw that we see WhatsApp and many other ways in which in, in communal situations, hate is becoming violence very quickly. So that's, that's the way in which I think in many ways it's evolved. I, I'll talk later on about the ways in which I think it's played out in American schools, which is, which is I think a breeding ground now for, for some of the divides that we're seeing play out in, in our streets, both with white supremacy and, and, and those kinds of systems of oppression, and certainly in the longstanding ways in which we are um, suggesting who is American, who is not, and who's part of this country and is subject to hate. So I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists from there. Yeah. Uh, so far, you've watched this uh, evolve for uh, much of these 19 years. You were in the private sector on 9-11, inspired to go into government service thereafter. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you've seen this issue and this problem evolve and, and what it looks like to you today. Thank you so much, Garrett, and uh, thank you to the IOP. I'm, I'm really happy to be having this conversation with friends. Um, it's a sobering anniversary. And one, when I think about, Garrett, what our thinking was uh, after 9-11 and in terms of what we need to do to stop the rise of the us versus them ideology, uh, I think you can look at it in a couple of different ways. One is how you, how you defined it when we began the conversation. Um, we haven't been attacked uh, in the same way since 9-11. There are indicators um, that are easy to measure. We had, we had 29 designations of foreign terrorist organizations on 9-11, uh, and today we have 69. There's an uptick, we can see the change, but I think that there's something far more dangerous uh, that has happened over the course of the 19 years that have passed since 9-11. The first is, um, while governments have understood that the us versus them ideology has been rising and hate has been rising, um, they, have, uh, they have looked at it in terms of uh, either an organization, an organized movement that's taking place and not connected it to how it's affecting communities around the world. And Anu just spoke a little bit about some of that and the bleed from that ideology of the us versus them. The other, Garrett, is, is the way we've talked about it. So on 9-11, of course, we were talking about Al-Qaeda. We were talking about these things that we thought we understood. Ideology, you can't put your hands around, you know? There are no borders around ideology. This isn't a domestic versus an international phenomenon. Um, and as, we, as, we, as we've evolved um, as, as policymakers, as citizens on planet Earth since 9-11, we have understood how something that happens in one part of the world can have an effect on another. And what it's left us with is a, uh, a far more serious and far more unsafe environment. This isn't just about the definition of violent extremist ideology, but it's about the rise of hate. And we weren't talking about the rise of hate on 9-11. Yes, there were the questions of why do they hate us, which we can talk about if you'd like to, which was the wrong question to ask. But it is what is propelling an ideology of us versus them, whether it is a neo-Nazi group or it's the so-called Islamic State, what is actually happening to our communities um, and what has shifted over the last 19 years so that we're looking at uh, a morphing of not just terrorist organizations, but the way regular citizens carry out uh, their lives so that you can have something that happens in Christ Church with one person doing such horrific damage, or you can have um, a, a larger organization do something in Mali. Um, we are looking at a, a different scenario 19 years later, but a, a, but a far more dangerous one. And Juan, uh, how have you seen this problem evolve? You, you've had um, a, a, an extremely front row seat to how these groups change and shift over many, many years. And, uh, and so what has this problem looked like to you over the last 19 years? Garrett, thank you. And, and thanks to you, Mark, and IOP for involving me and to my great fellow panelists for involving me in this discussion. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, you know, prior to 9-11, I was um, a junior uh, federal prosecutor in what was then called the Terrorism and Violent Crime Section. What was interesting then, Garrett, was we were focused, obviously, on al-Qaeda. I was on the 
embassy bombings case, later on the coal bombing case. So we were watching Al Qaeda as it was evolving and metastasizing out of Afghanistan and of Sudan. Um, we were also interestingly watching domestic terrorist groups. Keep in mind the 1990s saw quite a bit of uh, domestic terrorist activity in the US, the Oklahoma City bombings, Ruby Ridge, uh, the, the sovereign uh, citizen movement, the militias. Um, so there was a good bit of attention. In fact, um, I would say almost equivalent attention to what was happening on some of those domestic terrorist uh, movements and groups and, and cases as well. What was fascinating post 9-11 was the fact that there was a recognition that not only was Al Qaeda part of a, of a broader global movement, but it had a driving global ideology as uh, the animating feature. And so what, what happened over time really was, and I think what, what we're facing now is really a globalization of these ideologies that have embedded themselves in how extremist groups and movements now view themselves. And so, uh, as Anarima said, th there, have, there have been national movements, there have been hate groups, there have been conflicts within nation's borders or within communities. But what's happened now is those are now put into a global context so that what you have are, are ecosystems of extremism and of violence that are put into broader global ideological context so that when there's an attack in Norway, that attack in Norway in 2012 from uh, Brevik, Anders Brevik, is put into a broader ideological uh, frame and, and battle. Uh, when you have the attack in Christchurch uh, that we saw last year, that, that is put into a broader ideological and identity conflict globally. Um, the, the, what we've seen in Burma uh, plays out in, in a broader regional, if not religious and broader ideological context. So I think one of the things that's clearly happened through 9-11 and into now is this broader global dimension and this broader ideological ecosystem that animates violent extremism, that animates terrorism. And you see that over and over again. So much so that you know, prior to 9-11 and even through 9-11, there was a debate within the counterterrorism community as, you know, is this, is this a local terrorist group? Or is it an international terrorist group? And really, from a counterterrorism practitioner's point of view, the 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 key variable there was: well, are they are they plotting an attack? Do they see the U.S. as the far enemy? Can you see animating features that are, you know, facing them toward the West in a sense? What you see now are groups like that that have embedded in them the global jihadi DNA, and you have embedded in white supremacist groups and other groups a global DNA attached to their violent ideology. So I think that's one really uh, important and stark feature of the, the evolution. A second, and it, and it feeds off of what Anu and, and, and Farah were saying, the, the very means by which these groups operate um, allow them to be global, allow them to, um, to animate each other, to reinforce each other, even in some cases to fund each other, um, and the, the ability to, to innovate with social media, uh, with new forms of financing, uh, think cryptocurrency, um, allows uh, these groups to be much more active on a global scale. And I think that's what counterterrorism officials have been worried about for a long time. And, and when answering the question, are we safe or are we safer? There's no question we're safer but we're not yet safe in part because these groups, whether they be on the left, the middle, the right, animated by religious ideologies or, or nationalist ideologies or just sectarian ideologies, um, they, they have the ability to fit into this global construct ideologically and materially. And that's really the danger here that you have a conflagration of, of one conflict giving life to others and the ability of these groups to then support each other or even to conflict with each other. Um, and so Garrett, I would say that's the biggest shift that I've seen over the last 20 years is the globalization and the animation of these movements um, in opposition to each other and in a, in a sense reinforcing each other.
And, and that's really, Juan, has been something that U.S. Uh, national security officials have been warning about all year. Um, uh, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, spoke about this. Um, DHS has spoken about this and sort of the particular challenge of the globalization of the white supremacy movement, which to your point sort of had long been a relatively local threat. Uh, and now I'm not sure whether it's actually technically the most recent uh, terrorist designation that the U.S. government has laid out, but the, the move by the State Department this spring to designate the Russian imperialist movement, RIM, as a foreign terrorist organization uh, is sort of the, one of the first steps that we've seen to declaring white supremacy a international terror threat. I, I absolutely right. And if I could just feed off of that, Garrett, that was a very clear signal from the U.S. government that they were beginning to view these threats through that global lens. And the designation is a way of both marking that network, but also signaling that the, the parts of the counterterrorism community that worry about global movements, uh, global terrorism, would now have to be animated around these questions, including questions of how these groups are funding each other across borders. Uh, precisely what you said, Garrett, in the 1990s, uh, you had uh, state level groups around the world, in Germany, in, in Poland, um, in Michigan, all of which seemed to be you know, reinforcing each other in some ways. They would have common literature, et cetera, but there wasn't really an operational functionality to it. And I think that designation signaled that the FBI, DHS, parts of the U.S. government have to worry about this are now worried about the animating features of a global movement. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, basically the, the simple question of where hate comes from in, in whatever form it may take, whether it's uh, Islamic extremism, whether it's far-right nationalism, whether it's white supremacy. Um, uh, we, we've seen sort of a number of these groups uh, rise and fall over the last 25 years. Um, Juan ran through a, a laundry list uh, of groups and, and threats that uh, officials at various levels have confronted. Um, but, but what is sort of the foundation where this this problem begins. Uh, Anarima, could you sort of talk a little bit about where you have seen hate manifest itself in education and in schools? So I mean, it's, it's hard to go from the global context that we've been talking about to what's happening in classrooms, but I want to I want to actually talk about that briefly because what we're seeing in in classrooms around the United States and frankly around the world is increasing segregation across many different lines. And part of the, the result of that is that when we have classrooms where uh, we're not encountering people who are different than we are, uh, and we're not learning how to play together, how to learn together, it's, it's having uh, an extraordinary impact on the manifestation of that later on, which is in the kind of divides and hate that we're seeing coming out of a situation in which one, we have burgeoning numbers of, of hate crimes, of hate incidents that are happening in our schools themselves. And we see that largely uh, those, those incidents uh, are about race. Uh, we certainly see them um, impacting immigrants, uh, Muslims, uh, anti-Semitism -Sem incidents. And, and there's very different ways in which those kinds of incidents are reported or dealt with. And I think part of the problem is um, that uh, the, the, the tool that is most often used, and it's not actually used all that often, most of the cases, nothing is done, but when there is something done, it's done in a disciplinary context. And I think in some ways, that's not actually trying to teach values and engagement that is different for young people who, um, who are now learning how to turn to, to fear and, and divides and hate in, in school. And so I think that's the place that we need to start uh, to try and, and change a trajectory. I, I talk a lot about uh, the, the situation in Sanford, Florida, where a, you know, the school district was under desegregation order for many years, came out of it, and, and, and as we've seen around the country, we've seen rapid resegregation of schools and public schools in particular. And, um, and in that context, we, we get the situation in which you have a George Zimmerman and a Trayvon Martin. Uh, and, um, and, and 
what does it mean when, when, when you look at someone with fear and with hate, um, not because you've, 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 you've actually had any kind of encounters with that person, but because of the ways in which uh, we're, you know, we're part of an America today where those who disagree with us are people who um, we've now begun to think are evil. Right and um, or or that there there there's someone who um, that, that we have hate associated with someone we might disagree with and I think that's that's the trend that we're seeing among among adults and I think it's certainly the trend we're seeing among young people too and so you have a situation in which violence uh, occurs as opposed to um, a very different kind of engagement I do I do want to say one quick quick thing about where does hate come from more broadly and, and globally right now I do think that there's a way in which uh, when we think about where it's starting, the, the conspiracy theory is a disinformation that is literally then being fueled into people's living rooms, into um, you know, into their 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 homes, and and people are are, are not just hearing those things, um, whether it be on social media, whether it be on television, in places like Sinclair uh, Broadcasting, and the way in which it's coming into our radio and television stations. They are, they are then acting on that, um, and we're seeing that more and more. And so I think in some ways, uh, the, the fact that we see hate becoming um, the embedded in populism and embedded in popular movements, um, that, that they may, it may even be the reason for um, some, of, some of those movements. Uh, and, and we see fear and hate being something that is channeled across boundaries. Um, that is that is also a place where um, hate is coming from now, and and it, and very few people are immune to it. If they if they start going down one of those YouTube rabbit holes and and end up in a place where um, where where they're they're really buying into some of the theories um, that may have come from a from a country in a place very far away. Yeah, it, it, that's a a great point, Anarima. I um, in, in my journalism hat, I just published an article on. Uh, Caesar Sayoc, who you might remember was the uh, uh, in the run up to the midterm elections two years ago, sent a series of mail bombs uh, out to prominent Democratic figures. He was a prominent uh, uh, consumer, I guess is the best word, of the the president's uh, Twitter streams and. Uh, far right groups on Facebook and, and other social media uh, and sort of had his mind sort of slowly poisoned uh, effectively by that type of rhetoric that you're talking about in exactly the way that we are used to seeing in, in some ways. And this is where I'll sort of turn the, the question over to Far, where we've seen uh, groups like ISIS or Al Qaeda sort of recruit and radicalize followers um, it, using exactly the same playbook that Caesar Sayoc uh, ended up uh, becoming, you know, the first uh, bomber of the MAGA movement. Um, so, Farah, talk a little bit about the ideology and uh, of hate and where that comes from and how it manifests itself. Garrett, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about a conversation you and I had when I was in the Bush administration working at the NSC uh, with Juan uh, about the yeah. ideology of Al Qaeda and the young people who were finding it appealing um, and what was going on and, and how is it that they would want to, um, you know, attach themselves to, to such a vile figure who called for such horrible stuff. Of course, we had not imagined there could be anything like ISIS and beheadings. And I mean, that's just taking us to a different place. But at that time, um, as we were thinking about all of this, we were going to the very heart of what was happening with the young person as they were growing up, as they were becoming themselves. Um, this question of identity and belonging and who they are and fitting in. And, and, and we were exploring that more psychological component to that navigation of identity and what the bad guys had to offer those young people as they were navigating through that ideology. And I think it's important to remember, this is not true across the board, but let's remember that many of the, the bad actors out there are preying upon young people whose brains have not yet been developed. Um, you know, a human brain doesn't get developed until the age of 24, 25. And so if you're 16, you're 13, you're 21, uh, and you're trying to ask questions about who you are, and there's an us versus them kind of thing going on, and you're told to hate the other, uh, that, that is happening in the system that is underpinning extremism. So Anu was talking about 
sort of the culture and the education, which are, are definitely panels within that ecosystem that is breeding hate. Um, and I, and I, I want to specifically speak to the, you talked about ISIS, Garrett, specifically speak to um, the young people who are under the age of 30 globally who happen to be Muslim, um, whose the bad actors are running after them to have them um, become uh, part of their, you know, their armies. And, and I think what Anu said about what was happening in schools is really important. We are seeing obviously a surge of neo-Nazis and other groups like it who are not preying upon young Muslim kids. However, um, there is a commonality. It is the propaganda that is going out, as Anu talked about, in the technology space. But there's also just the very basic kind of propaganda about what's around you. What are, what are you reading? What are you learning? What is the music you're listening to? And whether it's rap or it's videos or it's TikTok things or memes that are happening, those messages are going to these young people saying that you will only belong if you buy into the ideology that, that we have to offer. And the next step, of course, is you buy into the ideology, then we're going to make you hate everybody that is different than you. So what, what I want to say is you have to ask the question, where in the, in the scheme of Al-Qaeda and ISIS and Boko and groups that are using Islam for their nefarious ends, what is animating, to use Juan's word, those discussions. And I talk a lot about um, what I saw when I was special representative to Muslim communities around the world and the influence of Saudi Arabia around the world through textbooks, teaching young kids that all Jews are bad or that the only way to be Muslim is to be a monolithic kind of Muslim. I talk about what's happening, um, not just in the textbooks, but what they're, what they're experiencing as living their religion out loud. Um, diversity is our friend. We want to teach young people to think um, that diversity is a powerful force. And, and, and that is true for, for um, those that would be potential recruits for a group like ISIS or groups that are the Georgia White Knights or the KKK. We can do more around puncturing the ecosystem that is allowing hate to thrive um, so whether it's education, whether it's cultural, whether it is our political or peer leaders that debunk this idea that hate is okay and that it is all right to go after the other, kids have to see this in surround sound all the time. So um, when I think about the ideology, Garrett, I think about the progression of all of this I, I belonging uh, and the sense of, of self that, that have to be looked at as we as we think about these really important questions. So Juan, uh, hate at a very basic level requires not just ideology, not just a place to learn it, but but infrastructure. Um, and so talk to us a little bit about your work on the terrorist financing side of this. For, for those of you uh, watching with, with us tonight, Juan uh, wrote a fabulous book about his time uh, in in this world, Tre Treasury's War, uh, that really sort of laid out how critical, you know, when we think about fighting terrorism, you know, we have this image of, you know, special forces and drones, and in many ways, the most effective tool that we have is to simply starve terrorists of the funds to do their day-to-day -day work. So Juan, talk to us a little bit about uh, just really simply how terrorists fund themselves. Garrett, thank you. And thank you for the very kind reference to the book. I appreciate that. I, you know, it's, uh, it's not as good as how we win from Farah, but, um, <laughs> but I appreciate that very much. Um, what's really interesting here, and may maybe I'm gonna, I'll, I'll sort of, uh, let me take a funnel approach here and talks about talk about the taxonomy of both funding and ideology because there's a there's a very important dovetail uh, that we realized early on and I think continues to animate the analysis as to how you starve terrorist movements of their their global reach uh, because the animating feature of the terrorist financing campaign or the the counter terrorist financing campaign um, really parallels the counter ideological battle when you talk about groups like Al-Qaeda, uh, but it doesn't have to just be one particular group. I think this goes for any uh, global terrorist or violent extremist movement of any stripe. 
Um, and that is um, you, you want to starve these groups of the, the ability to connect, to support, and to reinforce either their ideology or their operations. And part of the feature of, of counterterrorist financing was to make it harder, costly, or riskier for uh, any of these groups to raise and move money around the world. And so the strategy was really built around that and to make it harder for them to, to make strategic decisions simply because they had the, uh, the inability to have the kind of budget flexibility and the reach that they needed. And so the more you could constrict them, the more that you could make them uh, more of a localized issue, the, the better off we would be. From an ideological perspective, the same sort of core principle applies, which is the more that you, could, you can uh, either counter or deter the ideological attractiveness of these movements, uh, the more you're able to constrict their, their numbers, their, uh, their longevity, their sustainability, uh, the more it becomes a local issue that, that is more organic in, in nature and that, that can be handled in that way. And so one way of thinking about this, Garrett, is through the taxonomy of how these, these groups operate, how hate operates, how funding operates. One is organically, and I think you've seen, especially with the white supremacist movements, a much more organic sort of funding structure to how they operate. A lot of their operations, whether it's criminality, crowdsourcing, um, selling of, uh, of, of merchandise, it's all very kind of localized in form and, and, and not as well organized as, as you would see some, for example, transnational organized criminal groups. So there's an organic dimension to this, and you see this in, in terrorist groups of different, different types. The next level up, the next taxonomy, uh, is really a, a more organized hierarchical function. You saw this with traditional al-Qaeda. You've seen this with the Naxalite movements in, in India. You've seen this in, in other groups that just get more organized and over time develop their own business models and economies, whether it's the FARC in Colombia or al-Shabaab in Somalia. They, they have economies to them. ISIS did this, of course, with their caliphate. Um, and so that's a much more organized um, set of principles and, and way of supporting both the ideology and operations. You haven't seen that yet in some of these far-right white supremacist movements. But again, I think that's the concern of counterterrorism officials, that you begin to see a graduation to a more, more formalized uh, set of structures globally that, that animate. The final feature, which I think is really important to keep in mind, and this is certainly uh, something that Anu uh, mentioned and, and Far has focused on in her work, is the state sponsorship dimension. And I, and I don't think it, sh it shouldn't go unnoticed um, that state actors play a more uh, central role in how these ideologies are perpetuated, misused, um, and how disinformation campaigns reinforce these movements. And it's that in combination with the loss of faith and confidence in institutions, mm -hmm. uh, which has caused this really dangerous elixir uh, mm -hmm. where, where state actors can work behind the veil. You've seen this with Russian propaganda. You've seen this with Chinese propaganda against the democracy activists in Hong Kong. Um, in addition to the fact that there's loss of faith and confidence in, for example, the US intelligence community or the FBI to identify where those actors are, that's a very dangerous elixir. And so that, that level of the taxonomy, that question of what state sponsorship looks like, whether it's funding or from an ideological perspective is an important feature for us to keep a very close eye on. Uh, so, Juan, I want to open it up to students here in, in just a minute, but let me come back to something that you sort of touched on earlier, and let me ask you to put your old prosecutor hat on, which is the challenge, uh, um, the challenge of confronting many of these domestic groups is that there's a, just a, a very simple different legal structure for prosecuting domestic terrorists versus international terrorists. Um, and that uh, in many ways though, as we hear national security officials talk about this and they talk about the globalization 
of these ideologies, and particularly in the area of white supremacy, when you're combating a domestic white supremacist group as a prosecutor, you don't necessarily have the same tools that you would if they were a, a, a cell of ISIS or a cell of Al Qaeda. And so there's a very active debate going on in national security circles, um, which I, I'm, you are certainly familiar with, and so I want to ask you about it, is whether the US needs to update its legal structure to have a domestic terrorism law. Um, and I'm just curious what your perspective on that is, and then we'll open this up to some students. Garrett, it's a great question and, and something that goes back you know, years. It's not just a, a present question. Um, I, I, I happen to think that we have enough of the legal authority to deal with these groups that we need to. Whether or not we have a new domestic terrorism uh, piece of legislation that, that mimics 2339 from Title 18 or, or other provisions is really not the point here. I think there are three challenges that when you talk about the domestic international divide. One, it's the question of the First Amendment. And, and Far can tell you, um, you know, chapter and verse uh, with respect to the challenges that the State Department has, the US government has in uh, defining the contours of uh, free speech and incitement, right? And the, the distinction in the law is really when you move to the point of incitement, that's when you move toward criminality, whether it's conspiracy, aiding and abetting, material support. So that's one challenge just fundamentally. And a domestic terrorism uh, provision doesn't solve that question, right? What, what is this speech or is it criminal incitement? That's still there. Second component, and it goes to the point you'd made earlier, Garrett, about the designation is uh, we're much better at designating known sort of international terrorist groups that carry a flag and have a banner, easier to identify them. With that comes certain legal consequences. So for example, ma material support provisions, the ability to prosecute somebody for sending them money, for example, or sending them night vision goggles, which we do all the time for ISIS supporters, for example, domestically. That's harder to do if you haven't identified that group or that network as a terrorist organization so that those consequences ensue. So it's less, again, about a particular provision and more about the labeling of the group or the movement as a terrorist group. Um, and, and I would say that the final, final element is um, whether or not we have enough information to tell us what we need to know about these groups. And then, so this goes to the heart of are we gathering enough intelligence? Do we not know enough about their financial networks? What is animating these groups such that we can then uh, argue that not only are they a, a, a bad group, an extremist group, but they are a terrorist group because of their intention, their intentions to affect the political dialogue in the US, to impact the government, uh, to terrorize the population, right? The definitions of terrorism. Some of that we just don't know enough about yet. And so that's a, that's a question of information gathering. And again, what the FBI director has said recently is important in that regard because they're focusing precisely on that question. Yeah. All right, so we wanna open this up and take some student questions. Um, uh, Anand, I think you are up first. Hi guys, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Anand, I am a junior studying government. Um, and my question is, uh, to what extent do you think that uh, we've sort of shot ourselves in the foot in the progress that we've made um, with not only with terrorist groups, but with the relations uh, that we have with uh, you know, local people and lots of Muslims in uh, the Middle East region? Uh, I ask this because there has been an ongoing discussion that uh, the president's uh, remarks or derogatory remarks about Islam particularly early in his administration, helped accelerate efforts at, uh, uh, for recruiting at ISIS. Uh, and that sort, of, that sort of goes against you know, our goals in developing relations with people in the area, uh, but also um, we're shutting down ISIS. Uh, I wanna hear you guys' thoughts. Great. Uh, Farah, why don't we come to you first? Uh, Anand, it's very nice to meet you. Thank you for the question. I think it's a really important one. I think it's the role um, as, as we think about who we are as Americans 
to make sure that we give dignity to everyone um, in the words that we use and in our actions. Uh, and uh, you know, this is a nonpartisan forum, but I, I'm just being factual when I say that President Trump was the first American president uh, to use that kind of language against Islam or Muslims since the beginning of our country. And I know that um, because when I was special representative, I went back to every single American president, starting with George Washington, all the way to Barack Obama to hear and see what American presidents had to say about Islam and Muslims. And I think that the signaling that, that we have to send, um, there's a distinction between a foreign policy action in a country that might be Muslim majority and the way a country talks about uh, religion and faith and diversity. Uh, so navigating through that is very difficult, as I'm sure you understand, um, but I would agree with you. It's made it much, much harder uh, for us to do our, our work. And, and uh, just one last point, um, you know, the, the world doesn't forget. Um, it, it doesn't forget things. So Abu Ghraib is not forgotten. Uh, the images that happened then will be carrying with us for a very long period of time. The words that President Trump used uh, against um, countries in Africa will not be forgotten, against uh, Islam will not be forgotten. So I think we're, we're in a very difficult uh, situation because of it. I just add that I think it there's there's a, a moment I, I often think about uh, which was which took place in the Oval Office where Nadia Murad, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and and is Yazidi, uh, where the president you know didn't acknowledge what it is that she and her family uh, had gone through, which is that she had watched so much of her family uh, be killed and 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 raped in front of her. And I think there's a way in which it's important for us to also acknowledge the kinds of violence that are going on around the world and to, to far as point, like uh, to, to, to acknowledge the dignity and experiences. And I think if we erase those and don't understand the ways in which um, they continue to be lasting trauma, and I think about all of the the, the ways in which we have um, displaced and, and, and have the largest refugee population in the world right now, those are young people who are growing up in a situation in which um, they have been trapped for years, right? And, and, and not able to have an education, not be able to interact, not be able to work. And in those situations where we don't acknowledge that, I think it, it, it is also a different way in which we're dehumanizing and, uh, and, and giving some credence to, to the roots of violence. And so it's really important. I think we wanna to continue to, to acknowledge the ways in which violence has, has impacted um, you know, Muslims and many other religious communities around the world. Um, that's what, what, uh, what unfortunately sometimes we have not done in, in the way that we should. All right, I Garrett, think you, oh uh, yeah, go ahead, Juan. Gary, I'll, I'll be super quick because it's a great question. <laughs> the, the, uh, just to, to add to the excellent points, um, how we treat each other internally and how we talk about us as Americans is critical as well in terms of the reflection out. And I think all of us understand that. And so the more that there is an us versus them, the more there's a questioning of who's American, who's not, you know, all of that dialogue to me is anathema to uh, our, not just our patriotism and to who, who we are, but to a strategic goal that we have uh, to demonstrate to the world that you can be pluralistic, you can respect differences, and there's actual strength in those differences uh, that, that, um, that, that inures to our benefit in a very kind of crass material way, even if you don't believe it morally, right? So I, I think there's, there's a loss in that value the more that there's a rupture internally of that sense of American identity. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Ara, I think you are next. Hi, thank you so much, all of you, for coming and speaking to us tonight about this very intensifying issue and trend that we've noticed within our body, like body politic, but also domestic um, affairs in this country. In 2019, the House Judiciary Committee hosted it held a hearing on hate crimes and the rise rise of white nationalism that discussed so many of the trends that we're talking about right now. But what I'm interested in is the individualized motivated acts of white supremacy that have caused he federal hate crimes to happen. And you see both in public and private institutions, this kind of failure of accountability measures to combat these um, crimes from happening, either from underreporting with local law enforcement or when it comes to, for instance, Facebook, 
a few re- a, u- a few years ago, blocking white supremacist content, but not wh- blocking white nationalist content. And so I'm just wondering about your opinions on how we build these accountability measures. And even though this past summer, the Senate bill that would have codified lynching as a federal hate crime wasn't passed, it was upheld in the Senate. I'm just wondering if there are any current bills in either chambers that you're aware of that we as normal citizens can be aware of and just push our public officials to pass. Anu, uh, can you maybe speak to that a little bit from your position with the commission and how you're looking at these lenses through uh, religious freedom? Sure, I, I'm actually gonna speak about it from my lens as being a former Justice Department Civil Rights Division attorney uh, who, who was very much worried about um, the ways in which uh, there were accountability measures for hate, not only in schools, but also the ways in which crimes that were happening, whether they were designated as hate crimes. And one of the things that we have seen is in the gutting of the Civil Rights Division is that we haven't seen the hate crimes prosecuted in the way that they should be, particularly uh, around racial lines. And so uh, I I do think that there's um, the question of what laws are in place, and we've talked about that a little bit, and also the ways in which they're enforced. So for example, QAnon QAnon was, was basically designated in, in by one of one part of the FBI as a domestic terrorism organization right and I don't know what the what that means in terms of that designation versus messaging and rhetoric that suggests that that's something that that the president and others would support I think is 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 one of the ways in which we see some of these disconnects around who's considered terrorist and and who actually needs to come in and fight terrorism and I think one of the problems uh, and it certainly played out in Kenosha is this idea that uh, that and and you see it out of Charlottesville, where it's it's instead of it being a, a an act of hate um, that led to Heather Heyer's death and, and a lot of the violence we see there, it was uh, suggested that it was a failure of government and others to protect uh, what was what was going on. And when you have that that rhetoric happen, then it's it's opening up this space of of, hey, since 9-11, America is all about fighting terrorism. That's what we, you know, that's what people grew up in this in this uh, generation thinking they need to be out there doing. And so we see 17-year-olds, we see, you know, young people deciding that they need to join the fight against terrorism and who actually are terrorists is something that has been defined in, defined in, in, in really difficult and problematic ways. So for example, if we see a situation coming out of Kenosha where uh, not only were there the hundreds of reports to about the Kenosha Guard and, and some of the violence that might have been coming in and how that actually um, was, whether, whether that was addressed or taken down, one of the things that really concerns me is that afterwards we're seeing dozens of groups and dozens of pages that are reaching millions of people that are really praising um, the acts of, of a 17-year-old in killing two people, right? Killing two people that... Um, that are that are because of the ways in which this rhetoric has happened, we're calling uh, they're calling terrorists or pedophiles or many other things, right? And so this idea that someone was coming in to fight terrorism uh, is is this narrative that I think really plays into what you're asking about, which is how are we holding people accountable and who are we holding accountable and what language are we using in terms of uh, what the what the how the violence is being described. And, um, and, 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 and certainly supported in, in ways that I think are highly problematic um, from, from a legal end. And so if we're not able to suggest that, that, that killing two people is, is something that not only is, 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 a, is a criminal act, it is one that is, um, it is fueled um, not by a, an effort to fight terrorism, but, but hate, um, I think that that's, um, that, that's part of the, the, the problem that we're seeing. And so I'll, I'll turn it over to, 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 to others who can talk about some of the, the legal ramifications, but I do think that that's the, the nature of what we're doing in terms of, of categorizing Black Lives Matter, categorizing people of color generally as being, um, as being the, 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 the place where violence is happening, where terrorism is happening, where we have not had in all of these protests over the last couple of months, we have not had uh, a, a black person be the one who's pulling out a gun and shooting someone. And so um, there, there's a way in which I think uh, that narrative has really been um, turned on its head. Far, do you want to uh, give a 60 second answer? Yeah, no, Ara, I think that was a really important question. I, I would just say to you, it's not just from the top down, it's also from the bottom up. And we as regular people living in our neighborhoods and our communities have bigger voices that we can use. I, I have been very vocal 
about the fact that we have been lazy on hate as a country. I mean, what, what do we think is going to happen if we are just quiet about the things that we see? Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted that the conversations are changing in the context of all the hell that's broken loose uh, in the last few months, but far more needs to be done. And so I, I do think, I agree with you, laws need to be changed, all of this kind of stuff, but there's also action that needs to happen at a community level. And we need to support NGOs and others that are doing some really good work that don't have the kind of support that they need to do it. So uh, I want to try to squeeze in one last question uh, before our time is up here. Uh, Tim McCarthy, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, Tim McCarthy here. I'm on the faculty at the Kennedy School. Hi, Juan, classmate, Anu, dear friend. Hey, Hi, Tim. Uh, good to see you. I want a question about um, what role, not so much what role the U.S. government has played historically and in recent times to foment and sometimes perpetuate the racism and the hatred and the terrorism, both domestic and international, that you're describing. But I'm, all, I'm really interested in what you all think we as concerned and engaged ordinary citizens can do to hold government, our government accountable for these things when they cross over that line. And where you think right now for those people who are really alienated from government because of these human rights violations and wars and systemic racism, religious intolerance, particularly from our current administration, what, um, where we can or how we might maintain hope in government itself the electoral process and our democratic politics in a world where our government is often a perpetrator rather than the solution to the problem. Juan? I'll sure, Garrett. It, Tim, great, great, great question. And I'm gonna sort of piggyback off of Farah's last point because I, I'm a big believer that, um, that we have depended too heavily on the federal government and federal voices uh, for how we think about the evolution of, of, of all of these issues, but frankly, the cohesiveness of our society. Um, and, and I do think this is a moment for all of us to step back and say, um, not only where are, the set, are there centers of power, but where are there voices and um, elements of influence that can shape what comes next? And I think there's been too much of a retreat and a dependence on you know, what the president says, whether or not you like the president, this president, past president, um, what the federal government can can or can't do um, in the context of these issues that we're talking about. A lot of these issues boil down to state and local authorities and what they can and should be doing with their resources. We've seen a lot of the questions about policing. These are local issues. These are about training. These are about how resources are allocated. This is about how communities understand um, the relationship with law enforcement, right? These are local issues. The question of whether or not Forest Point NGOs or civic, um, civic uh, organizations have the means uh, to, to do the work that they're doing. I just read Just Mercy again. That's a great book. And it's, a, it's case in point of the kind of grassroots work that uh, individuals and lawyers and others can do to, to foment change and to bring justice to people's lives. And so the one thing I would say, and especially to, to this group that's joined us, is that there's enormous power in you individually. There's enormous power in what you can do together. There's enormous power in the voice of Harvard um, in what it can do. So let's not get captured by the narrative that you see on cable news every night that what the president says or does is the be all end all or what happens in Congress is the uh, alpha and omega of what can be done in this space. That's absolutely not true. Tim, I'll just say that we, we need to be building, this is about what community we build. We build. It's about what, um, whether we build a community of belonging and inclusion, uh, where we're, we're learning about each other, where we're engaging with one another, where we, we recognize that we have tools to be able to uh, resolve differences that we may have, that we may just agree right? as opposed to thinking that those differences have to be things that are instilled with fear or with hate or with violence. And I think that's where every single one of us, and I, I, I go back to Charlottesville, one of, the, one of the most extraordinary stories about Charlottesville is the ways in which the community came together to fight hate. 
And that's not the story we tell of Charlottesville. It's not the story we tell of professors and students and dishwashers and community members coming together and training together in nonviolence to combat hate. And I think that's one of the things that we all need to uplift in different ways is the ways in which we see um, those kinds of, 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 of movements and, and community building uh, moments and, and, and to lean into those and to have those be the ways in which we think about this in the context of our schools and workplaces uh, and communities as well. Can I just uh, add to that? Uh, Tim, one of the things I, I talk a lot about having, having gone around the world looking at NGOs that have spectacular ideas, community leaders that have spectacular ideas on how to fight hate, uh, if we could just scale them, uh, we would be in a much better situation. And I think one of the biggest problems we have is intellectually thinking that this is just so hard, we, we have to boil the ocean. And so we can't do it and we're not gonna start anywhere. But you stop hate one person at a time. And it sounds so cheesy and so ridiculous, but we know it is true that the way you raise your children, the way you treat somebody in, in, a, in a line, the way, you, the way you think about, to Anu's point, like this, this sense of community, um, we can actually revolutionize things. And I've watched it happen in, in, in Uganda. I've seen it happen in India. I've seen it happen in the Maldives and in Surabaya. I mean, it doesn't matter where in the world we are. We see in, ingenuity around this idea of cohesiveness and, and building together, building the communities that we want. And so what I'd say to Americans is the richest country in the world, the most innovative country in the world. And now I'm speaking directly to the young people at, at, who are watching this um, at Harvard. There are so many ideas that are, are, that are within you that can be born, but there are also so many ideas of people that you know that you think if they, they can use some help in getting them off the ground. And, and what I would say the challenge is today, especially to Juan's point where, where we're being bombarded with everything on cable and we think it is too hard to deal with, to bring it back down to the local level, to bring it back down to yourself and think, what can I do? What can one person do? It takes all of us. And then the final point, um, I just, cause we didn't raise it and I just want to say, I believe very strongly that companies have a very large role to play in their sense of corporate purpose um, when it comes to fighting hate. And they have not, this is not just the tech companies, this is the way we look at ESG, this is the way we look at how, what a company stands for. And I think the consumers that are the clients of these companies have to demand the way we do with climate change, the way we do with others, you can do more to fight the us versus them ideologies around us, whether it has to do with gender or sexuality or race or whatever it happens to be. And that final question, Tim, is a great place to sort of wrap up. And I wanna thank Farah and Anu and Juan for joining us tonight in this virtual IOP forum. And I hope the next time that I see all of you, we will be in Cambridge together. <laughs>